Hi, and welcome to the first in the Clean Energy and Energy Management webinar series. Today's webinar will be focused on EGLE's energy efficiency programs for communities. This series is in collaboration between the oops, this series in collaboration between the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE, and the University of Michigan. I'm Hannah Smith, a second year graduate student in urban and regional planning. Also on the UM team is Leah Edelman, a student in UM's Public Policy School, who will be helping with the Q&A today, and Sarah Mills, who manages this program. Our speakers for today's webinar, Julie Staveland and Miles Beal, are both at Eagle, and we'll have them introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentations. For today's webinar, all attendees have been muted upon entry, and we will handle questions via the questions feature, on the GoToWebinar console, as you can see on your screen. We encourage you to submit your questions as they occur to you throughout the speaker's presentations by entering them into the questions field on the webinar console. After each speaker, Leah will share the questions that came in with Julie and Miles so they can answer. When you submit a question, it's visible to the organizers only. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Julie Stablin to introduce herself and start her presentation. Thanks, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Energy Efficiency Day. My name is Julie Stavelins. I'm the current manager and state energy program specialist with the um, sustainability section that is uh, within the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE as we call it. And with me today, I also have Miles Beal, but we're gonna keep him off camera and he'll be on in, in a couple minutes. So we're kicking off today this energy management series and clean energy program um, with letting you know kind of who we are and what we do. So I would like to share with you a list of programs that we offer within energy services um, and kind of tell you who we are. So energy services is the, um, and I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a lag because I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there we go. I think I stopped. Okay. So energy services, we're the state energy office um, that's designated by the Department of Energy at the federal level. So there's 56 energy offices within the United States that include states and territories. Um, our programs are funded both through federal and state funding. And our main goal is to move the needle. We are trying to increase energy efficiency as well as acceptance of renewable energy. And our main goal is to promote healthy communities, economic growth and environmental sustainability through energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. And we're hoping that through all these energy projects, we can help catalyze growth and jumpstart Michigan entities to help them reach their own energy goals. So through this, we have a series of programs that we offer, um, and I have a list here, but I'm not gonna go through it all on this list. I've got some other slides that you can look at that's a little bit more entertaining. So the first one that's most relevant to this energy series because it sponsors this program is our energy planning and policy grant. So we have a grant with the University of Michigan um, to help us help communities across the state and determine what needs there are in planning and, and, and policy as it relates to energy. So we'll, one of the first projects we started on was a database for zoning for renewable energy throughout the state. Uh, we also conducted a survey and we're curating a repository of templates and guides, um, FAQ case studies for communities. And then um, University of Michigan, Dr. Sarah Mills, as you saw her when we first did the introductions, um, provides real-time consultation for communities to kind of help them navigate what their next steps are. And then of course, this webinar series. So as I mentioned, we did the database for zoning on renewable energy. And so what this did is this, um, with Dr. Sarah Mills and her team of interns and graduate students looked at all of the jurisdictions within the, within the state and identified where their zoning is at. Is it at the county level, local level, is it unzoned, or were we unable to find any data because it just wasn't online um, and they didn't have a website for their current their jurisdiction. And then once we found that zoning data, we looked at it to see if there was any mention of renewable energy. Was it wind? Was it solar? And for solar, was it residential or was it commercial level? And then even looking at EV chargers. And so this is a database that's free and available on our website. And if you have to, to be in a jurisdiction that uh, we don't currently have any data on, we'd love for you to send it in so we can finish out flushing out that database. And this is a way for communities to see 
what other communities are doing so that they can either say, okay, I want to do that or I don't want to do that and to compare how their zonings um, are between the two and then they can update their policies. We also conducted a survey <clears throat> and this survey was sent out to all local jurisdictions. We have 1,856 in the state. Um, we got 1,300 responses back. So this is the Michigan Local Energy Survey or MILE. And we use this data to kind of better understand where our local officials are at in the energy management spectrum. What are they thinking about? What are their perceptions? Um, and how we can engage them in future energy um, activities. So for example, one of the questions looks at, you know, have you done an audit on any of your public facilities? And so this is a, you know, a sample response on that. So statewide, 40% of jurisdictions have had some sort of energy audit on one of their public facilities. Most common, it's like their town hall, or their fire station, but also police station, wastewater treatment facility. And so we use that data to cultivate programs in the future. We see where the gaps are in areas that we need to work on. So energy audits only 40%. Let's see if we can't bump that up. So let's provide funding for another, um, for entities to do energy audits on their public facilities. So one of the other projects that we work on um, are roadmaps. And so for these roadmaps, they help us identify where we need to go, both in terms of what are the gaps in our knowledge, where are the gaps in our programming, and also where is the technology um, coming from. So we've got four main ones that uh, we're working on rolling out this fiscal year. Um, so we actually just recently closed our energy storage roadmap, um, and we're reviewing applications, and so we're hoping to get that awarded out here in the next month or so. And this is going to look at energy storage capabilities within the state. Um, and, you know, in looking at going to clean energy, energy storage is going to play a, a key component in that. We're also looking at an energy asset roadmap, a clean tech roadmap, and a geothermal sector roadmap. And all of these are kind of looking at how we can position Michigan to be a leader and a forefront in those areas, both in economic growth, you know, what's the supply chain for these industries, um, what can we do to help the development of clean technology, and then how can we expand adoption of some of these new technologies. And as part of these roadmaps, once they're done, we've, we've been doing these for a while, um, then we come up with programs. And so one of them is Charge Up Michigan. So we did a study with MSU that um, analyzed a lot of data and looked at a lot of different um, information to analyze where within Michigan can we place EV chargers so that EV owners can have a worry-free travel throughout the state. Um, and so through that study, we identified 74 nodes throughout the state. As you can see on this image with the green dots, those are all the nodes that were identified. Um, and then we developed a program for that. Okay, so we've got the places where they should be, but how do we fund it? And so we came up with this modeling structure, and this is the basis. Um, adjustments need to be made. We know that not every place is the same. But the, the ultimate um, underlying idea behind it was we could split it into thirds as the state will pay a third, the utility would pay a third, and then the site host would pay a third. And it's a great partnership to work together because you gotta have all the players in there in order to get this flushed out. We've got about a little over half of all those nodes um, have applications. Um, we've got 10 that are actually online, that EV chargers are installed and online and people can use them now. Those are those black lightning bolts on that map down there. Um, and we're still accepting applications. This is funded through our VW funding that we got through the settlement fund. Um, we had allocated about 9.7 million and we've awarded about a little over two and a half right now. Um, so we're still accepting applications for that program. If anyone is interested in that, let me know. Um, the next phase of this project is gonna be Charge Up My Fleet. And so this one will be rolling out this year where we partner with municipalities and transit authorities who are in the process or are working on transitioning their fleets to electric vehicles, and we'll work with them to help fund the chargers for those fleets. Another program that we developed based off of a roadmap was our agricultural and rural businesses program. And so, um, as you know, as Michiganders, you know, uh, our rural population is only about 20% of the overall state population, but it's over 90% of our land mass. So, um, you know, it's a lot of territory. And so from the roadmap that we had done, it was identified that basically we need more financing opportunities and we need to provide more education and outreach. Um, and so we have this incentive program that um, is gonna be open to agribusinesses, rural businesses, and other entities in these rural areas to help them with energy efficiency projects. So in the past, uh, we rolled this out uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we've done grocery stores, 
heat processors, greenhouses, um, some nonprofit stores, um, and help them with energy efficiency projects such as lighting, insulation, windows, cooling systems uh, that help them reduce their energy burden because they're more efficient. And the next program that we have is our um, Small Manufacturers Energy Waste Reduction Program. So similar to our Ag and Rural Program, the Small Manufacturers um, targets the small manufacturers that have 500 or less employees, and manufacturing takes a lot of energy. So if we can help the manufacturers reduce the amount of energy that they need to consume to do their manufacturing, then we can help them reduce their energy burden and help provide um, Michigan manufacturers um, an edge to be more competitive. Um, and we're looking at this year, expanding it to um, renewable energy and energy storage, as well as backup generation, because we all know the power goes out sometimes. Um, and then partnering that with significant energy efficiency implementation. And these projects are both for the upper and the lower peninsula. One of the other programs we're doing is a technical assistance pilot for combined heat and power, or CHP. So this program um, looks at ex trying to expand and accelerate CHP adoption, which basically takes the excess heat um, or energy that's created through other processes and then repurposes that towards um, heating and cooling or um, into electricity. And so this provides funding for entities to determine if CHP would work for their particular area um, and for their needs and if it's feasible or not. And so this provides a little bit of technical assistance for those entities because it's a very complicated issue and it doesn't work for everybody. So we want to make sure that those that are interested in it, they can get the access to that technical assistance. There's just a little bit of lag on my slides. And Hannah, I don't know if you can advance them for me, if that might be a little bit quicker. So one of the other grants or programs that we have is our clean tech development. And so we've got kind of three phases for this one. Um, and that looks at providing resources for those entrepreneurs and those developers um, on getting their ideas out to market. So um, the first phase is the technical assistance, you know, so working with those um, entrepreneurs and those developers um, to get their product well defined and how they can bring that to market. The next phase is our Clean Tech Product Launch Program, and that is in partnership with the Lawrence Tech University uh, Hardware Accelerator, and that's to move it from the next phase. Okay, now you've got an idea, you've got a prototype, let's get that prototype to market. And this is working with helping small businesses um, move those ideas to the marketplace. And then the other program that we have is the Michigan Match Assistance Pilot Program. So the Department of Energy at the federal level has competitive grants all the time. Um, but one of the requirements of that um, is a match. And so for businesses or other entities that get that federal funding, we can help provide some of that match assistance for that program. Next slide. So this next program um, is actually in, in result of um, the pandemic that we've gone through. And so this is a K through 12 public school HVAC assistance program. So we're working on developing a checklist and um, providing assistance to schools throughout the state to provide that technical assistance and some funding to look at their um, heating and cooling systems within their schools to determine what upgrades need to be done, both to make them energy efficient and make them also more resilient in these types of situations that we're in right now so that schools can open more quickly um, and be safer for our kids to attend. Next slide. Another program we have is our Clean Energy for Low Income Communities, or also known as CELICA. Um, and this is a um, community solar program that looks at how we can address low income energy challenges 
as well as providing access to alternative energy that wouldn't otherwise be available. So we've partnered with other state departments, um, energy service providers, um, and utilities um, to form a partnership to um, provide community solar. So we've got three kind of renditions. We've done two phases already and we're currently in work on our third phase. The first phase we looked at uh, working with a cooperative, and this was in the northwest portion of the Lower Peninsula on the Cherry Lands um, Electric Cooperative. Uh, we worked with um, the Community Action Agency there and with Cherry Lands, um, and there were 50 families that were on that one, and they're currently receiving solar credits for theirs. The second phase worked with a municipality, um, a municipal utility, and that was up in the Upper Peninsula in Launce. And we worked with um, 25 families that had energy efficiency um, services conducted on the home. We're doing some more data analysis. And then they're also receiving some solar credits. And this next phase, we're looking at our investor-owned utilities for those larger utilities that already have solar programs and how we can adjust that or modify that to make it a sustainable program for low-income families to participate as well. And we're looking at rolling that out this fall. Next slide. Another new project that's coming this fall is our water energy nexus. So in terms of the water and how it goes from the water treatment facility to your home, for those of you that aren't on a well, there's a lot of treatment. There's a water pumping, the treatment facilities to get that water to you. There's a lot of energy involved with that. However, if you've got leaky pipes, you're basically wasting some of that energy and water through those leaky pipes. And so we're looking at that water energy nexus to try and address some of those needs. How much energy can we save by fixing these leaky pipes so that there's less water wasted and there's less energy wasted. This also addresses it from the lead pipe aspect. Um, as you know, Michigan has a lot of lead pipes for their water, for their water lines, and this will address a way to possibly replace those as well. So we're working on getting that out. So it will help with energy savings as well as addressing some of the health concerns with some of those lead pipes. Next slide. And then last but not least, we have our community energy management program. And this is technical assistance and funding for communities and public K-12 schools. And I'm going to hand it over to Miles. Thank you, Julie. As Julie mentioned, my name is Miles. I'm the Community Programs Coordinator in the Energy Services Unit. Um, our team is made up of a, a handful of folks. Everybody kind of has their, their niche, their area of specialization, minus the communities. Um, and we're going to be digging into sort of the crown jewel of my programs, the community energy management program. You'll hear me say community energy management. I might say CEM. It's all the same thing. So let's get right into it. If I can move the slides, maybe, maybe, there we go. Or maybe not. Sorry, guys. Okay, I think we got it. So. The big idea with the Community Energy Management Program is to, first and foremost, above all else, make things easy for you, the, the grantee. Um, if you've applied through foundations or other government organizations before to get funding, you can know how cumbersome the application process and just the administration can be. You know, there's caveats uh, all over the place, do this, not that, spend it this way, not that way we try to remove that burden as much as we legally can anyways uh, to make things easier for you um, and, and we don't want the program to dictate to you what you might need uh, we want you guys in the communities uh, to tell us how we can be of service to you you live there you work there you know much better than we do so uh, that's sort of the the idea is that you come to us and then we help you with some funding um, if you don't know what you need that's okay too. That's that's not a problem. We've had people uh, write in applications that are just you know, literally the words "please help," and that's fine enough. Um, you know, we target a lot of communities that have demonstrated need, a lot of smaller municipalities. So you know, we understand that people wear a lot of hats, and you might you know see a need, but maybe you aren't really sure what it is fleshed out into a fully actionable idea. That's fine if you don't have a dedicated sustainability person on your staff in your community, that's okay. I've literally been to meetings this last year. I was over in the thumb for this last round of, of grantees meeting with somebody who was applying, and we had two people at the meeting when I showed up, and they said, hey, we need to wait for a third. It's our facilities manager. Uh, we want him in on the meeting. I said, well, where is he? And they go, 
Well, the guy who sweeps the streets, he called in sick today. So the facilities guy is out sweeping the streets. So I understand you wear a lot of hats. You might not have the technical expertise on hand, but if you think you have a problem or you can see something and you need a little bit of extra help, let us know. We would love to help you fill out an application or get going with the community energy management process. So beyond that, the other sort of big idea, the other cornerstone of the grant is this order of operations that we preach. Um, you can see the flow chart there. If you've seen, uh, if you've seen us before, you've probably seen us uh, you know, throwing this flow chart out there. We use it quite a lot. Um, we wanna meet you wherever you are in the energy management spectrum, but we definitely have a, a rubric for what that spectrum is. And it starts with benchmarking, moving to energy audits, efficiency upgrades, and then renewable energy. And, and there's a method to the madness. We're gonna dig into that a little bit more uh, just to kind of flesh out the ideas a little bit better. Again, if I can get my slides to work. There we go. So benchmarking, it's kind of the old business school trope. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That's the philosophy that we apply here. Um, and, and it really holds true, as corny as it is. Uh, we want people to know where they're where they're at before they try to get moving in any kind of direction and that starts with benchmarking um i would always recommend energy star portfolio manager for benchmarking a lot of people watching this are probably very familiar with energy star benchmarking it's been around uh, the portfolio manager is free to use i'll say that again it's free to use so please make use of it um really you're just inputting your utility usage data uh, this picture right here is uh, a dashboard screenshot of some of the, the outputs and reporting that you can get from Energy Star. Um, if it looks intimidating, if it looks like there's a lot of work involved, if you're not great with computers, uh, Energy Star does do webinars all the time. Um, they're, they're really good if you don't make a webinar. They do have a pretty deep YouTube catalog with instructions on how to use it. Um, there is, you know, a whole lot of great information and resources out there if you're just getting started. And also, if you don't want to fiddle with that, you can always contact me or somebody else in our office and we can kind of point you in the right direction and get you started on that journey as well. Um, and it's not only about benchmarking your buildings, but it's about seeing how you compare to others. So it's another nice tool with Energy Star Portfolio Managers. You're seeing not only yourself, but how you're comparing to similar size and use buildings as well. Uh, to sort of give you a better idea of you know where you fall in the grand scheme of things it's a really really nice tool hannah can i get my next slide so after benchmarking after you figure out where you are uh, you can kind of dig into it a little bit deeper uh, by doing an audit so this is sort of a like i said a deeper dive into where your building is and what you can take action on and sort of the industry standard for for auditing is, is ASHRAE energy audits. There's three different levels to them. One, two, three, uh, as you get higher in the numbers, the audits become a little bit more uh, in-depth and technical. Um, level one audits, uh, if you have a, a small building, if you're a, you know, a small municipality, or you're a small school, um, and you've got a facilities person, you kind of know what things are doing, uh, a level one audit is probably fine enough for you. Uh, it's it's going to tell you sort of what's going on um, and they'll probably help you with benchmarking and they'll give you um, kind of a little bit of a, a, a guide on what you should do next. Um, a level two audit, they're great. Um, if you can afford to do a level two audit, definitely do it. Um, you're going to get uh, a little bit more information from the level two audit um, in terms of like, you know, what, what your savings could potentially be, what the cost of some projects might be. So if you are you know, having to, to pitch an idea, if you're budget conscious and you need to tell the person who has the purse strings a little bit more information about why you should be spending money on energy efficiency, having a level two audit in hand is probably gonna be a useful tool for you. A level three audit, there's nothing wrong with a level three audit. Level three audits are great. If you have the money to do a level three audit, if you have the time to do a level three audit, um, go right ahead. Uh, for a lot of the folks that we work with, it's probably going to be a little bit overkill. But again, if you and your stakeholders decide that's what's best for you, please don't let me get in the way uh, of investing in, in any kind of audit that you'd like to do. Next slide, please. So 
So you've done your benchmarking, you've done your auditing. Next thing, energy efficiency upgrades. Now, everybody probably knows LED lighting, HVAC upgrades are, are also you know pretty obvious things to do, especially living in, in a cold climate like Michigan. A lot of our you know heating and cooling costs, or I should say, a lot of our utility costs come with uh, you know keeping spaces comfortable and warm in the winter time. Um, Lesser known things, variable frequency drives, um, motor controls on things that you probably wouldn't think of unless you're a facilities person. Um, insulation is always great. However, your walls are only so thick, you can only add in so much insulation. Uh, after a little while, you wanna get into building control, smart thermostats, occupancy sensors, things like that. Um, and really what you decide to do with your energy efficiency upgrades, your order of operations within kind of this little scope, is sort of how you want to attack it. Do you want to do, you know, all of the low hanging fruit, get the low cost things out of the way? Are you looking for the shortest payback period on your investment? Do you want to go for sort of the big ticket item and tackle your biggest, most expensive need first to try to, you know, take the biggest bite out of your problem for your energy management? You know, it's really up to you. I'd encourage you to eventually do all of them. Um, but if you if you have to pick and choose, it's totally understandable. And again, if you are applying for the CEM program and you want a little bit, uh, little bit of guidance on how to interpret your benchmarking and your auditing, definitely let us know. We can always be of service there to help you uh, sort of figure out your, your plan of attack. Next slide, please. A little bit of a, a sidebar here. With your energy efficiency projects, there's uh, kind of a, a second sub-step within them. And it's rebates. These are great. I used to work in the rebate field before I moved over here to the state. I can tell you that they're they're totally worth it. These these can make or break projects. So uh, regardless of what you're doing, um, if it's as easy as sticking light bulbs into the ceiling that are energy efficient, or anything else you can imagine, your utility provider might have a rebate for you. Um, you know, both the big investor-owned utilities, DTE uh, and consumers, have pretty you know deep rebate catalogs. Um, and if you're not sure if your utility provider has those rebates, give them a call. We usually have a dedicated team that can help you out. I will say, having worked in that space for a little while, you do have to be mindful of some deadlines when applying for your rebates. There are uh, its own order of operations when it comes to announcing your project, you're doing your project, you're submitting your paperwork. I know that sounds cumbersome. Some contractors will even tell you that it's so cumbersome that it's not worth doing. That's not true. Don't believe them for a second. Uh, your rebates are completely worth it. And, and if you get on the phone with the right people at your utility provider, they can help you streamline the process and it shouldn't be a big deal at all. Speaking of contractors, if you find yourself in a position where you have a project and you're not quite sure who to call to get it done, if you don't have a, a preferred contractor that you work with or that's been vetted or you've used already, um, you can definitely call up those utility providers again. Um, they can't explicitly say, you know, if you've got an HVAC project, you can't go down to Joe Schmo's heating and cooling and they'll, they'll help you out. There's, there's conflict of interest there. They can't specifically name anybody, but they can usually point you in the right direction of uh, people that are usually referred to as trade allies. Those trade allies are going to be people who have worked with the utility provider before, specifically in the rebate program. And they can oftentimes help you uh, with actually filling out those applications as well. So they're a good resource to have if you're not sure who to use. If you do have somebody, definitely work with them. We want you to be comfortable with whoever you work for. But again, if, uh, if you're looking for a little bit of direction, those are always some great resources to check out. Next slide, please. Here we go, the solar part, the renewables. This is the stuff that everybody likes. This is this is the sexy part of energy efficiency, um, and, it, and it's great. If I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I could put solar panels on top of City Hall in every city across Michigan, I would, because that'd be great. But you have to do those order of operations first. Um, and it comes down to this idea of right-sizing your solar, making sure you're not spending too much, you're not, you're not overkilling with your solar panels when you didn't need to spend that much. And our friends at AC Tripoli um, back in 2016 did a really nice study. They crunched the numbers and they came up with uh, these figures here. So you can see that 
you know, again, on average, and this is kind of a big average to throw out, it depends on your project, but on average, your energy efficiency costs you about eight cents to, to wipe out one kilowatt hour. So pretty good deal. Solar, on the other hand, 17 to 23 cents. And that range kind of counts for, you know, the, the best case scenario solar, like, you know, you're living in sunny Nevada, and then the 23 cents is more on the high things, you know, you're living somewhere in the gloomy northeast uh, where there's not as much sun. But however you slice it, your energy efficiency upgrades are, are going to be the most cost effective thing for you to pursue early on. Um, and they also, in the ACEEE publication, they, they used a great metaphor that I wanted to share. They, they described solar as peanut butter. I love peanut butter, you love peanut butter, unless you have allergies, and then probably not so much, but they described it as peanut butter and avoiding too much of a good thing. If you make just a peanut butter sandwich and you've got all that peanut butter there, it might taste great, it, but it's gonna stick to the roof of your mouth. That's no fun. It's hard to swallow. You gotta have milk ready. Don't do a whole peanut butter sandwich. That's not great. Take your peanut butter, marry it with the jelly, create a PB and J, the J obviously being your energy efficiency measures. I could talk about sandwiches all day. I had a very light lunch, but if you take away nothing else from this, just remember the peanut butter and jelly side of things with energy efficiency uh, in your solar panels. Can I get another slide, Hannah? So, sandwiches aside, we wanna talk about the year that was. So, I shouldn't really say the year that was. We still have uh, three grantees that are working on their projects. With COVID, we had some turkey jerk start and stops in the middle of our program year, but uh, in total, we had 11 people sign on for CEM this year. Uh, you can see on the map that we're up to the tip of the UP and down as far south as River Rouge, so uh, a good swath, a good mix of people here, um, be it municipalities, schools, housing authorities, economic development regions was really, really pleased this year with the nice mix of folks that we had, um, as well as the nice mix of projects. We, we had solar, we had lighting, we had HVAC. Uh, we really covered our bases pretty well, I think. So I was, I was really happy with that. Uh, one thing I'm not too happy about, if you're on the call, if you're listening to me, if you're watching, and you're from one of these areas, like the middle of the UP or, or Southwest Michigan over here, where there aren't any stars, I'm putting this on you. You need to give me a call. I want more stars for you on this map. So. My only bone to pick. Uh, please let me know if we can we can include you here. Um, we definitely want to to uh, diversify this map as much as we can. Next slide, please. So, big success story this year. Um, one of my favorite projects. This is uh, the Gladwin Regional Airport. Um, we helped them put in these wonderful solar panels. Again, everybody loves the solar when it comes to doing their projects. They look great in newspapers. They look great on websites. Um, and you know, Gladwin, to their credit, did their due diligence and has been going through the process of following that order of operations and, and inevitably got to here with the, the solar installation. So they did a great job. What you don't see in this picture is uh, at a, a different office within Gladwin that the city owns for, for office space. Uh, they, they wanted to do solar. However, sticking to the formula of going through their progression, they realized they weren't there yet. And as part of this project, they installed LED lighting at that other facility. So they had a nice mix of, of, uh, of projects going on within sort of the same application, which is very nice. The solar panel right here, when they flipped it on in June for that whole month, they had generation of 425 uh, kilowatt hours. So they're with their uh, metering agreement with uh, Consumers Energy, they're well on pace to pay for it within the 20 year expected lifespan of the panels. I wouldn't be surprised if they got 25 years, but in any case, a solid investment and in overall a really great project. Next slide. Okay, so this one, it's not a sex theme. That's why I threw it in here. So this is from last year. This is the city of Everett. They, they did a really great job of following the steps again. They had five phase two audits that they did the year before this project at, at five different buildings that the city owned. Um, they came to the conclusion two of those five buildings were in greater need than the other one. So, so they went whole hog. They, went, they did the whole thing. They got new lighting, new insulation, HVAC systems, unit heaters, just a fantastic program. And, and this is, again, why you shouldn't go right to solar. There's so much bang for your buck here. And 
this comes down to you know not only the energy efficiency and the cost saving side of things, but when you're talking about HVAC especially, this is about comfort of your offices, comfort of your facilities. So if you're the kind of person that keeps the space heater by their desk and wraps themselves with a blanket and is hunched over trying to type that way at their desk in the middle of February, wouldn't it be so much nicer if you actually had an HVAC system that worked and you had unit heaters that were up to date and highly efficient? I think you'd be more productive, you'd be happier at work. So there's 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 multiple things to think about when determining what your projects are. But you know, don't be discouraged of the less glamorous stuff that doesn't photograph as well. I'm sure you could walk around your houses right now and see very similar pictures. So it's not exciting, but it is necessary. It is good. And I would, I, again, can't advise you enough to stick to that order of operation. Next slide, Hannah. So new program year. Our program year and fiscal year started October 1st. So while we do have a little bit of an overhang with our grantees that got started late, we will be launching into the new program year with new grantees more funding, more grantees. The nice thing about CEM, I said we try to make it as user-friendly as possible. That, that includes the match requirements as well for the grants. There is no match, it's free money, it's the best kind. Um, the grant does operate as, as a, a rebate, so you do have to have funding upfront to pay for your project, but as you go, you will be reimbursed, uh, sort of how we set things up. Um, priority is going to be given to communities that have not received funding uh, either this year or in years prior, so we do, we do keep track of that. And all of our projects, once we do launch the RFP and update the website, which I think if I read my emails correctly, probably late next week is when you'll see the website be updated and you'll be able to, to drop off your request for proposals. Um, you know, from that point through July 31st is when projects will run unless we run into another weird COVID situation then it could extend. But as of right now, keep that in your mind. All projects concluded July 31st of 2021. But we're, we're really excited to launch. We, like I said, we've got a little bit more money in the budget this year. So uh, bigger projects, more grantees, it should be a, a, really, a really great program here for us. Next slide, please. probably wondering, do I qualify for all of this cool free money that you're giving away, Miles? The answer is, of course you do, probably. Uh, municipalities, like I said, um, public or other no-cost K-12 schools, higher education institutions, we've worked with, like I said, economic development authorities, public housing authorities, sheriff's offices, if you're a library, public museum, firehouse. If you serve the public and, and are a free use facility, let us know you're one of the folks that we want to talk to. Priorities, uh, like I said, are given to those who have participated before. Also, if you're a low-income community, rural community, if you participated in the Rising Tide Communities programs, or if you've been impacted by a coal power plant closure, we will give special consideration to you. We do kind of operate things on a first-come, first-served basis, um, but we do you know, have these caveats and these things that we look for during adjudication as well. So, you know, get your application in as early as you can. If you aren't right on top of the, the launch deadline, don't worry about it. If it's, you know, a month or two down the road before you get your application in, um, we will, you know, it is a rolling application, so don't worry if you're not first in line. But, um, you know, we do, uh, you know, try to make it as, as equitable and, and space things out as evenly uh, as we possibly can. Uh, the only thing that I would say with your projects when you do go to submit your application, please try to avoid any groundbreaking. Um, if you have a historic facility that you want to work on, we probably will shy away from the project. Um, and if you have to change up permits, we would like you to not do that. Um, but otherwise, if it saves energy on your premises, go right ahead. Next slide, Hannah. So, uh, as you probably heard Julie say um, before she handed it over to me, she was talking about uh, a program that we were developing in response to COVID-19, um, the, the K-12 through uh, HVAC program that we have. Um, and we kind of want to make ourselves uh, as useful in, in to answering the call that came with the crisis as we can. Um, so you're, not only are we doing that, but everybody is trying to, within their you know, little sub-disciplines within the energy services unit, try to find a way to make an impact too. Um, and what we're doing with communities, 
uh, is sort of a sister program to the Community Energy Management Program. Um, we are earmarking funds uh, specifically to help out with food security, uh, most notably uh, helping uh, these, these facilities upgrade their cold storage facilities. Um, so if you are uh, serving a high-risk population, um, you know, it's food banks, soup kitchens, um, halfway houses, et cetera, uh, and you are serving meals or providing food on site, um, you know, we would like to help you with, with getting some upgrades done to your cold storage facility. Next slide, Ham. So why cold storage? Um, you're trying to address a public health and economic crisis through the sort of narrow lens of energy efficiency is hard. So this is sort of the, the best that we could think of, um, you know, so close to our, our launch for our new program year. Um, but we think it's going to be really beneficial. Um, cold storage is, is a huge chunk of operating costs for these facilities that provide these meals. Um, and you know, above that, their budgets can be largely shoestring as it is and made up of a lot of donations. And with the economic downturn, probably going to see donations take a dip as well and eating into the operating budgets of these facilities. So you know, whatever we can do to help counterbalance those scales we think is, is pretty good. Um, you know, and this statistic, uh, when I was kind of, when I was developing the program and, and sort of looking over justification for this, um, this Feeding America stat really jumped out at me. Um, you know, since last month, they've seen a 50% increase in the number of people seeking food assistance. Um, and there's going to be this 8 billion meal uh, national supply gap. So really, whatever we can do uh, to, to make a difference, we would like to do. So that's, that's sort of what the, this program is being grounded in. Next slide. So eligible projects for, the, uh, for this, um, it is cold storage and cold storage, we're casting a really wide net. This can be full cold storage rooms, walk-in coolers, freezers, refrigerators, um, you know, whatever, you're, whatever you want to do to increase the efficiency there, whether that's, you know, transferring to LED lighting, if you have uh, warmer, old, old-fashioned lighting within those uh, the cold storage rooms, we would love to help you replace those. Whether you're putting in ECMs, you're putting in some, uh, some motor controls. Um, if you do have a cooler room and you have, you know, sort of those old-school flaps that hang down, um, we can get rid of those and put in high-speed cooler doors. Um, really, whatever, we, whatever, um, we can do to help. If you do have your own suggestions, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, definitely let us know. Um, we're shooting for $15,000 per applicant, so hopefully uh, that will, will go a long way for these folks. Next slide, please. So what up? Beyond CEM, beyond our cold storage grants is launching, uh, if you're not a grantee, if, if you aren't uh, you know, one of the lucky folks chosen to participate, but you still need something, Call us anyways. Uh, we're, we're not just here to administer grants. We're here for technical expertise, consultations. Uh, if you need some, some light advocacy work done for energy efficiency in your community, if you're putting on an event and you need somebody to speak, definitely let me know. Let our staff know. We'd be more than happy to help. Um, and if you do have any questions about other programs, we do work in the materials management division. That's our, our friends in recycling and pollution prevention. So if you have questions about those folks, and you're not sure who to get in touch with, you have our information. We're more than happy to steer you in the right direction. Next slide. And I will welcome back Julie now as we're gonna transition into questions, I believe. Thanks, Miles. So we've got about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leah. No, go ahead, Julie. As I say, we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. You can type it in the chat box, and then our um, lovely assistant, Leah, will help us um, answer. We'll read those questions, and then Miles and I will answer. Or if we don't know, we'll get back to you. Um, so go ahead, Leah. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. We have a few questions. So one of the qu first questions is directly about that $15,000. Um, does it go directly towards project cost um, for the ultimate user? Yes, so with, with our grants, with uh, the monies that we award, um, we do not cover uh, like direct staffing costs. If you have contractors that work outside of you, the money can be applied to them. 
Um, but uh, you know, mostly we would anticipate the cost uh, going towards the actual infrastructure being upgraded or installed in the facilities. Okay. Then another question we have is someone who says they're in a rural area and they're interested in solar or some type of energy efficiency and they're asking where should they look? What is the first step? First step, give me a call. Um, my, my contact information is right here. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, there's not, there's not a good one size fits all for, for these kind of things. So, you know, we probably need to have a little bit of a conversation to see what your goals are for energy efficiency to see uh, where we're installing things. Um, and then, you know, sort of go from there. But, you know, first step, get in touch. Let me know uh, how I can help and we can develop a plan together. All right, another question we have is, is there a minimum amount to submit a project? Someone has a small project under $1,000. Absolutely not. No, you qualify. Again, give, give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. We have room for you. All right, and then one that's about where funding comes from energy efficiency programs. They're wondering if um, energy efficiency charges on electric bills go towards the source for free light bulb shower heads, et cetera? It's kind of a more general question. So no. it, yeah. it kind go of, ahead, Julie. Oh, I was going to say, so it, in terms of like where we get our funding from, so we get it, um, a portion of it from the federal government. So that's our Department of Energy funding that we get as part of the state energy program that each state is allocated um, based off of, you know, what Congress designates plus, you know, that was a formula with like how many people we have in our population and some other factors. Um, in terms of state funding, um, there is a portion of the public utility assessments that is um, and that is directed to our office to offer these types of programs. Um, and then Miles, I think you might be able to better answer the question on where the utilities get the funding for their energy efficiency. Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds like from the question you're, you're referring to that, that little surcharge you see on your bill. Um, those those dollars go towards the the rebates that I was talking about earlier. So if you apply for a rebate through your utility provider, that rebate money comes from those surcharges you would see on your bill. So it's kind of free money, but you've kind of already paid into it a little bit. So it's one more reason to use it. All right. Now a question about the specifics of the Gladwin project. How much did the two panels cost? Did they have to install powered storage units too? And how much energy energy did it provide for the building? So they did not install any power storage. Um, the total project cost, I think, was just for the the panels and not the installation. I want to say was like seventeen thousand somewhere in that neighborhood. I think with with installation costs, they were creeping up towards twenty. Uh, while it is a no match grant, Gladwin did uh, provide some funding themselves to make up the difference. Um, but yeah, they were they were able to install that all of that for about seventeen thousand, I think. And as far as power generation is concerned for the year, I do not know. Um, like I said, it was you know nearly five hundred kWh for their first month in June. Um, I think with their net metering agreement with consumers, I think that irons out to like. $60, uh, depending on what their agreement is, but I think it was about $60 that they were netting from that. So um, it, it, it's a good deal. And like I said, it will end up paying for itself before the end of the useful life of the panels. Okay, thank you. Another question we have is, how do you apply for any of these programs? Is there a web page that is best for finding more information for each of these programs? Yes, there is. Yeah, so if you're looking, yep, um, oh, go ahead. All you. <laughs> um, so on the bottom, underneath uh, the upcoming webinars, is our main web address. So michigan.gov forward slash energy, um, and on that page, there will be a funding opportunities button that'll basically take you to all of our programs. We've got uh, ones that are open right now, ones that are coming soon, and then ones that have been closed. So you can see all of our funding opportunities there, um, and then. We can also provide you with links when we follow up with this meeting um, to some of the other funding opportunities that are available through like recycling or pollution prevention as well as part of the sustainability section. 
Okay, thank you. That is the last of our questions, aside from people asking if they will have access to a copy of these slides. Yes, we're going to be providing a copy of these slides as well as um, a link to the recording of this presentation on our website um, in the next two or three weeks or so. Once we figure out exactly where we want to put it, we might put it in a couple of spots, but we'll definitely email it out to the attendees um, as well as provide a copy of the answers to the questions that were asked today too. Um, and then as a side note, um, I do have listed on here some upcoming webinars that might be of interest for you. So next week on the 14th, there's Business Sustainability Uncensored. This is through um, one of our, our partner units within the department, uh, the sustainability section um, in pollution prevention that looks at um, sustainability. And then a continuation of this webinar series that you're in right now, we have the Michigan Energy Code Adoption Process that's on the 15th, and then Energy Benchmarking for Municipal Facilities on the 22nd. And then stay tuned, coming sometime in November, we're going to have a webinar training um, for Catalyst Communities that was announced earlier, um, or I'm sorry, at the end of September. So stay tuned, more information to come. And if there's no other questions, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I um, hope you have a good day and happy Energy Efficiency Day. Thanks, everybody.